All right. We are live with another episode of Fire Builders Live straight from Key West, Florida. Uh, my name is Josh Corporal. With me today is Frank Vitale. Frank, welcome to Fire Builders Live. Well, thank you for having me, bud. Yeah, this is great. We've been friends for a while. Uh, and um, and before I introduce you, if you're not familiar with how Fire Builders Live works, we bring on experts, we take gigantic topics, we break them down into simple steps. People that people can do every day consistently to learn or make their lives easier. And today we're talking all about film and video. Frank has quite the impressive rap sheet, I have to say. Uh, you know, you've directed and produced over 150 films and documentaries. You've got a 75 awards for all of that work. You've taught at the New York School uh, of Visual Arts for the last 40 years. Um, you have a film now that is playing in, it played in Sarasota and now it's gonna be in the Brooklyn Film Festival called Erotic Fire of the Unattainable. And uh, your Montreal, Maine um, feature film has been in places like London, uh, Edinburgh, AFI, MoMA, The Whitney. I mean, so you've just, you've kind of like, you've been around, man. You've done some pretty amazing things. Uh, so, so tell everybody, where you are and uh, and how you kind of got started, and then we'll get right into it. Well, I'm a, a, a serial filmmaker. I love making film, um, whether I'm making money at it, which I've supported my family that way, or not. Um, so I got started just by working as a working for still photographers, and just gradually drifted into film. Worked on a bunch of films. I worked on. Um, some features with a guy named John Avildsen, who did the, the first Rocky film and the Karate Kid movies, and he went on to have a really stellar career, and I learned a lot from him. Um, and I also taught film at the School of Visual Arts, or I'm still teaching it. Uh, uh, the I just love making films, and that's when I teach films, I don't teach students how to make films, I just help them make their film. Uh, and now I have this movie, Erotic Fire of the Unattainable. It's a feature-length film. It's docu-fiction, which means it's a combination of fiction and documentary. Um, but you could call it all fiction because it looks like a fictional story. There's no interviews. Uh, and um, I'm really pleased that it's playing, going to be playing in Brooklyn at the end of the month and played in Sarasota, just finished in Sarasota. It was uh, the number four film out of 100 as far as these are, are virtual screenings now. There's no brick and mortar screening. So uh, people uh, sign in and in terms of Sarasota, they pay $3.99 to watch the film. But Brooklyn is going to be free. The Brooklyn Film Festival has organized it. that um, They're not going to charge people. You just have to sign up and you can watch the film. So, uh, Well, go and that's, that's different than, than the way that it normally works, right? Um, where these film festivals, they, you know, they charge people to get in and, uh, and, and with the Brooklyn one, anyone is going to be able to see this, this film. It's just going to be, um, you just kind of hop on online. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 So well, it, tell, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, like, I'm curious because if I could go back to what you said previously, right? What you, you got into film, but what is it that you actually like? If you could articulate what it is that you love about filmmaking, how would you do it? If you, Go ahead, because uh, help me, because basically uh, what I do know is that I love making films. Why? Uh, I can guess. Uh, um, I, I like... Uh, I like preparing. There's a lot of preparing that goes into making a film. For example, if you're going to shoot three days, you might prepare for a month. I like building it and preparing it and dreaming about it and planning it. Uh, the heartbreak is it never works out the way you plan it. But um, <laughs> but that might also be something good as well, maybe. Oh, absolutely! Like it's always it's always good. It's always good. It's it, it is always good. It still is painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but it always works out better. We, I just, I just did a short called Moon Moon Nymph about um, a nymph who haunts this complex that you know about the Garner complex, um, and we were, you know, I spent my month preparing, and I had an actor, uh, two actors ready to go, all the locations, crew all lined up, and the actor came down with food poisoning, like as I was driving to the location to start, you oh. know, putting the fin finishing touches on. Um, so I had to 
scramble and uh, find somebody else. And uh, the person I found was much better than the person that uh, didn't do it. So, you know. So it worked out, but that's yeah, okay. and plus it was a rainy day. It would have it was a rainy day in December. It would have been cold and miserable. Um, of course, it was pretty cold uh, a few days later in December, but it wasn't raining. Well, so it's all about. It seems to me in that that it's really all about adaptability, like adaptability. So as you're making these films, you know, you try and plan it out as best you can. I feel like that's just a good parable for life, you know, and and work is that you. You know, you try to have a plan, you try to prepare, but you just, you never really know what's going to happen. And uh, especially in, you know, in the filmmaking industry. And for anybody that's listening to this, Frank, if, if you had to, you know, kind of start all over again and, and tell your stories through the lens, the way that you've learned to do now, you know, what is it that you think is the most important thing as you're, as you're trying to express emotion as you're trying to express a feeling or a shot uh you know what do you how do you think about this in terms of uh you know in, in terms of how you lay it out and and uh, how you prepare etc well i'm going to address more um how you think about it and i uh um i th film every film's an experiment so there's no right way to do it I think we go into things like this wanting to do it right. I know a lot of my students do that. They want to do it properly. They want to know what's the right way to do it. And I try to gently explain to them that there is no right way to do it. Um, and I think this comes from, I know certainly in my life, when I was younger, like a child and, and vulnerable, someone may have, uh, uh, I don't know, gotten angry at me for doing something, doing something stupid that I didn't think was stupid, but suddenly it's stupid and and I was hurt. So I avoided that. And uh, I think we're, um, maybe people who want to make films are, are sensitive people and they're going to get bruised as they grow up and it could close them off. It could make them um, wanting to do things right, wanting to do things that other people are not going to beat them up about. And unf unfortunately, that's the exact opposite of what has to happen in film. The, the only thing that you can, um, uh, what you have to do is you have to be uh, inventive when you're making the film. And there's only one place that that inventiveness can come from, and it's from inside of you. Um, so you have to somehow uh, bring that out and expose your feelings, the ones that you're afraid of and the ones that um, you're scared of people knowing about you. You have to be able to somehow bring those out. And that's the only way you can make a good film. Um, I know when we first talked about this, you talked about a methodology of um, working with, uh, and I thought it was really terrific, of working with film and uh, maybe experimenting and maybe gradually um, uh, bringing that out. Just, and I wanna ask you about that, but before I ask you, I wanna let people know that these taking small steps gets you a lot further than trying to do one big leap and falling on your face. Um, I just, my example was I started doing marathons, or not marathons, but triathlons a while ago. And I, um, uh, but I hadn't run. I wasn't a runner. I hated running. So I'd got this app, uh, Couch to 5K. Um, it's like, I think it's three miles, 5K. And it took me nine weeks, uh, three times a week, to gradually work up to being able to run uh, three miles. I never thought I could run three miles. And I know if I had run out the first day and tried to run three miles, I would have just given up. And I have given up a hundred times. So that's so that's what I liked about your concept about how to uh, explore and get comfortable with your own creativity. So why don't you tell me about that again? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, before I do that, uh, one, I think that the advice that you just gave about not wanting to protect yourself so much. In fact, it's more about seemingly exposure and exposing yourself to the elements and and you know, enduring those bruises and stuff that your most creative and your most impactful work actually happens. It seems to me that that's, that that's the way it works. And I have seen that 
true in my own life too. So um, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Do you think that, um, that, you know, as we talked before with the idea of, of, you know, I asked you, I remember asking you, Frank, if I gave you an emotion, right, how would you express that through the camera? So if I said, show me fear, right? How would you do it? And, uh, and I remember you didn't quite have an answer for it because maybe there is no right answer. The, the, the answer really is in, in the pursuit of, of trying to express fear. And there's so many different ways to do it that just like you said, there is no right answer. It's just, it just is a feeling with a lot of different shades of gray. I don't know. What do you think? You're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I couldn't come up. I mean, I felt a little bit inadequate <laughs> because I couldn't come up with, um, you know, I'm a director. I'm supposed to know about things like that, but I don't. I, you know, if I have a scene where someone is supposed to be afraid, um, I can't go in with some kind of system or method or something to say to people. They read the script. They know they're supposed to be afraid. We rehearse the scene. Um, I might say, well, it's cool that you're smiling, but it feels like you're afraid because you're smiling. So in other words, I might accept something that I wouldn't ordinarily accept uh, in, in kind of theoretically uh, because it works. So it's an iterative process. Um, and I also know that everything doesn't happen when you're shooting. Uh, and I know that a lot of times I would shoot when I was younger and everything I wanted in the scene wasn't there. But it doesn't all happen there. A lot of it happens in the editing and the music and the coloration. Um, so um, uh, I'm not sure what the, the message is other than don't expect it all to happen in the shot. It's not going to. The movies you see are very heavily processed. To bring to bring out the emotion that they want to bring them in, so you have that ability when you edit. Again, you choose music, you choose a shot. You have multiple takes, multiple angles. Yep. Sometimes my students would shoot something that seemed kind of bland, but then when they would cut a lot of fast cuts together with this music, suddenly it, it, not, it just completely changed. Huh. It's funny that you mentioned this because I was just having a conversation with someone the other day and we were talking about this, this very thing. And the fact that I think a lot of people out there are so used to seeing these incredible productions, all of the color correcting and the, the sound editing and the music. And when they go to shoot a video on their phone, right, and they look back on it, they compare it to all of the things that they've seen on television and they immediately think that, you know, what they just shot is crap because it doesn't look even close to what, uh, you know, to what they're used to seeing. And that's just not true. You know, you just, you have to, it seems that you have to provide the opportunities for you to let those little bits of magic happen as you're shooting, you know, and as you're filming and don't be so judgmental about yourself. You know, it, it does take practice, but it's a practice that, um, you know, can be a fun journey. Well, I mean, judgmental is, is absolutely the right word. We are judgmental and we hurt ourselves uh, when we try to judge our stuff or we compare it to other things. Um, there's no right way to do it. And uh, I mean, even I, after doing this for decades, Every film something new. Every film is scary. Every film could be a, a flop. Um, but there's no, you just have to do what you can at the t in the time, finish it, get it out there, and let other people decide whether it's good or bad, not you. Yeah. Oh, man. And that's I, that to me is exactly what you need to do for any creative work. You know, for me, even creating software feel the same way. You just have to make it, get it out there and let, let people decide how they want to use it. Right. And not try to impose my plan so much. And I feel like there's a lot of similarities with what you're saying. And, and I, I should put this up because uh, I think this is important. I don't know, you can see this on your screen too. Some, uh, some comments as far as, you know, the most intimidating part of learning to make a film showing vulnerability about what you believe is good can ultimately become what makes the film epic. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Who's Sterling 
Is that you? No, that's actually, that's actually my sister. She's in Nashville at the moment. Okay, okay. Did she say this though? I didn't say this, right? No, no. Yeah, she just commented on on. She's oh. like, they're watching this right now. People are watching this right Hi, now. Sterling. <laughs> oh my gosh! I didn't. Well, uh, nice to meet you, Sterling. Your brother's a terrific guy. I really, really uh -huh. like. Him. I, he's an adventurer, and um, I love his sense of adventure. I absolutely love it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yes, you you guys would get along. And and uh, and let me put up Stevens here, right? So if I understand, you need to be open to the magic, willing to expose yourself emotionally, but you also need to know some amount of the craft or people who know the craft. So what do you think the balance is? Well, I think that you're right about that. You should learn the craft, and there are craft things that um, help you. Um, but some people get held back. I remember some. there was one student who kept taking classes, one class after another, because she wanted – to know what she was doing. In fact, I um, I made my first feature in Montreal, Maine. It did really well. And then after that, I said, okay, I got to figure out, I got to know what I'm doing. So I went out and made a, a safe movie. And it turned out to be not so good. And um, it, it was not the right choice for me to make at the time. So sure, you got to learn the craft. But, but people can go out, children can go out with iPhones and make great stuff. So... I'm not saying you shouldn't know the craft. I'm just saying don't don't get too hung up on that. Um, at a certain point in my career, I knew cameras. I really knew them well. Uh, but but people that didn't know equipment uh, wrote stories that were good films, and they became very successful directors because they knew the aesthetics. They didn't know um, the, at least the technical craft. Um, so yes, you have to know the craft. It's good to know the craft. I like knowing the craft, but don't let it get in your way. It's not, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is your heart. It's almost as if, as if the harder thing to learn is to listen to yourself, you know? So if you're going to focus on anything, focus on learning how to do that. And as in the process of that, the technicalities of learning the craft will come. Absolutely. In fact, I get chills when you say that because it's scary as hell to listen to yourself. It's very scary. And yeah, and then put it out there, like actually listen to yourself, listen to yourself enough to to act on some piece of art or some idea that you want to produce. But then but then having the courage to put it out there into the world and and be vulnerable and receive criticism on it. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, I mean. I think it's I think it's amazing what you're doing, and uh, so that takes me now. So the one thing that people should do, just to recap for for those of you just joined us, um, is to and tell me if I'm wrong, Frank, but essentially listen to yourself, right? Like try as far as putting emotion in, how to express emo emotion through the lens. There are a lot of different ways to do that. It's really more about identifying how you see fear. You know, like personally, subjectively, how you see fear, and 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 then once you've done that, experiment with different ways that you can that you can do it, and don't put so much pressure on yourself that it has to be a certain way or it has to be right. It's the Nike thing, yeah. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> just freaking do it. Uh, so, well, and that's all fine and good, right? And. I, I get people listening are probably saying to themselves, yes, in theory, that is, that makes complete sense. In your experience, how have you actually put that into practice? So was it that you went out every day and devoted a certain amount of time to just shooting, being able to focus and just shoot? Um, or like, how did you implement those little consistent steps, much like your couch to 5k? Um, well, can I ask you, because you had a great method that I would, why don't you tell, tell me what, and I'll follow up, but tell me what your idea was, because I thought it was really good. Well, we were talking earlier about, uh, about identifying an emotion, some type of emotion, like, like again, fear, and, uh, and then giving yourself maybe 15 or 20 minutes every day for a week, and just going out, taking your phone, and shooting something that you thought represented fear 
in some way, shape or form, you know? And then at the end of the week, looking back on it and starting to, you know, starting to pick apart like what you liked and what you didn't, what you think came across well and things that didn't necessarily come across well. Cause I, to me, that does two things. It one starts to get you more confident in understanding and, and um, expressing emotions with your camera. But two, you, I guess you also start to develop your own style, yeah. right? Just naturally. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I think, and I would take it one step further. Uh, everybody can edit. They can edit on their iPhones. They can. So, so you've got to be able to edit, hopefully. So take that stuff and take the stuff you like and cut it together just with sloppy, you know, just throw it together um, and then put some music on it. And you might get chills like I'm getting right now. Really, that's kind of some magic happens when you do that, even though no, at no point along the way did you feel brilliant or did anything look like it was going to work out well. But magic will happen. And um, uh, yeah. You know, as we're talking about like making magic happen like that, uh, Stephen, so the question that you that you answered about uh, about knowing the craft. So this is the same gentleman. And uh, one thing that he said here was, is 59 years old too old to start down this road asking for a friend? Uh, whether or whether or not that's true, um, what do you think as far as age? Do you think you can learn this and start experimenting pretty much at any age? I think so. I'm, I'm um, you know, I'm past those years and uh, just made a new movie and I just made a new short Well, I'm just working on it. Um, Grandma Moses started painting at 90 or whatever. So uh, I don't think there's any age limit. I think uh, it, it is, you know, it's, it's a young people's world as far as professionally uh, and making films is, is, is hard. So we don't often have the same energy at 59 years old. But why should that get in your way? I mean, there's a million things that are going to get in your way of whether whatever age you are. So that's just, you know, one of the things you have to deal with. I dig it. I dig it. And, uh, okay, well, so speaking of the film that you just made, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you just made a film. In fact, if people – I'll put this up here. So if uh, if people want to – connect with you they want to see some of the stuff that you've made if they if they're interested in watching erotic fire uh how what do you got going on now a little bit more in detail and how do people uh, get in touch with you um well they could uh email me at vitali.film at gmail.com i have a website called vitali productions which uh has a couple of reels on it and a bunch of my short films and also the trailer for this movie, Erotic Fire of the Unattainable. Um, and they can go to the Brooklyn Film Festival. There'll be a, um, uh, my film will have a site, uh, the festival. Uh, I don't know if there's any contact information there, but I hope you go and see it and then get in touch with me. I'd love to hear, um, because uh, again, you expect a, a director to, to go out and make a film and they know what they're doing. I unfortunately don't know what I'm doing. I, I, in fact, I work best when I don't know what I'm doing. Somehow I want to do something, I do it, and it turns out okay. Um, so, but I'd love to hear from people um, what they think my film's about. I'm in the process, and that would be very helpful to me because I'm in the process of trying to figure out how to market the film and what the audience is. And I'm just going to say one thing about when I was editing this film and I got I spent a, a winter editing it, and um, I started to put it out, show it to Gay Wally, who's the actress in the film. I was scared I had nothing. I, I didn't know what I had, and uh, in the process, there's a lot of times where you go through, uh, you go through doubt on yourself. Now, the film is doing really well, uh, but it's hard to see that uh, in the interim stages. So I don't know what keeps me going, but you have to keep going. You just have to keep going. You know, and that's just another just another example of how of how you know maybe maybe people watching this, uh, your impressions of filmmakers and directors, like 
maybe you got it wrong a little bit. You know, there's, there is so much doubt, self-doubt, and so much vulnerability that goes into creating something that's never been done before, or never been created the way that you've created it before, and expressing that to the world. Again, opening, your up to, opening yourself up to criticism, but at the same time, um, incredible praise if you've done a really great job. Uh, and I encourage everybody watching this to go check out the film because, uh, you know, in fact, what I'll do is I put your Vitaly Productions uh, thing on uh, in the description. But if you've also got a link to the Brooklyn Film Festival site, uh, or in fact, actually, I think Stephen might have put that up here. Hold on. Let's see. Yeah, actually, he did. Here. This. So, we'll put, yeah, we'll put this up. We'll put this up there, too, uh, so that people can click that link and go straight to that. So, thanks, Stephen, for putting that up there. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I don't even have that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. It starts on the 29th. So the, uh, yeah, May 29th. So, that's when the films will be available. Okay. Uh, but All they're right. putting these together, these um, uh, links to the specific films and I don't know. I have to find out how Stephen got it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, this, this has been an incredibly um, satisfying conversation for me. It's, it's always great to talk with you, number one. By the way, Frank and I, we used to work in a Starbucks in Nyack, New York. And Frank was the only other person that would stay longer than I would at that Starbucks. You, I mean, you pulled like eight, nine, ten hours at that place sometimes. And... Uh, and I would see this, I would always see you there, and I'd be like, man, I need to, I need to know who this guy is. Who is this guy? And then uh, one day we just started a conversation. You were editing a film, and, uh, and we just started a conversation. And honestly, we've been friends ever since. It's like pretty amazing. It is amazing, too, Josh, because I was feeling the same thing. Who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> All the time working. Very cool-looking guy. Uh, and I found out that you were just as cool as you look. So that was oh. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I try. I have no idea what I'm doing either, <laughs> to be honest. Until I got invited on his boat, uh, <laughs> which was an honor. It's a cool boat. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. And uh, and I'll tell you, open invitation to uh, to come back. We can do a film on it. I know you've got something in the works. You, I remember you telling me uh, about um, like something that had to do with the river. Um, so I don't know if that's still in the works, but we can, we can talk about it. Okay, cool. Well... Thanks again for being here. Just your vulnerability, your your like how honest you were about this whole process, I think helped a lot of people. So um, so thanks again. And I wish you all the best. Go see Frank's film. And this is Frank and Josh signing off from another episode of Firebuilders Live. We'll see you guys next time. Adios. Thanks.